This is Twit. You know, uh, uh, Pam, one of the, the, the big questions that Rod and I had that we wanted to ask you today is kind of where you see the priorities uh, of, of U.S. Uh, human spaceflight uh, taking us. We've seen a lot of things going on. Uh, of, of course, the the recent um, Artemis One flight, which was amazing to see that SLS get off the pad uh, on, on on that flight, and um, and uh, and of course the the ongoing work for for Artemis Two. So I, I'm curious if there is a hierarchy that you would you kind of hew to for what you see as like the primary. Uh, 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 priorities for for the for NASA in human spaceflight is it is it you know the moon first and then orbit is it a mix of 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 all of those things I know there was a talk um, earlier this week um, in, in Congress about the 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 future of the ISS you know as it as it winds down mm-hmm. and um, uh, and and the subsequent stations to come there uh, so I'm just curious how do you approach that uh, from an operational standpoint about where we need to go together. Uh, and how to get there. Yeah, it's it's actually really just fascinating work. And the philosophy that I bring to it is that you actually have to start mentally at the destination, paint the picture of what it is you're trying to achieve. What would good look like? What is it that you're actually trying to do? And then what happens then is then that's called architecting from the right. And then you flow backwards and say, okay, what are the things that we need as a part of that vision? What, what do we have to achieve to, to achieve that vision? And the challenge always is, of course, because you're dealing with um, everything that you're doing today. We continue to execute operationally everything we're doing today. So you have to recognize you're also executing from the left. And the challenge is really focusing on the future and how you are going to transition from where you are today to where you're trying to get to. So uh, the key insight really about what we're trying to do is that this is not about the moon. It's not about Mars. It's actually about a sustained human presence and responsible exploration throughout the solar system. This is what I believe the American people wants from us. I mean, how many times have you heard it? Well, why did we go to the moon and then we didn't go anywhere else? And, you know, look at the proliferation of uh, science fiction uh, out there. And it's like, when do we make this giant leap that humans are going to go off the planet and in, in a persistent way and a sustained way? And uh, it is an awesome vision. <laughs> But all of a sudden, a lot of things become clear. I mean, we learn from station logistics. People need supplies to support mm-hmm. them. So all of a sudden, you start flowing that down. And it really became clear that if we don't practice this on the moon, it's going to be way hard to do it at the next destination. And so ideally, we're going to practice this on the moon and kind of polish up what we consider a blueprint, like, okay, this is what you need. This is what you need. This is what you need. We learned a lot from building the space station, uh, which we would like to transfer those lessons learned to LEO to commercial destinations. They're not going to look like ISS. We have stuff on ISS we use every day, like a thousand times a day, like we wish we had more of it or more capability and stuff we don't use at all. So the idea is to practice, to learn, Let's go do a demo on Mars and let's start thinking about where the next destination is after that. And, and from that, I guess from that description is, is the, the priority then, because you mentioned it's not, it's not the moon or, or Mars, like in terms of a specific end goal. It sounds as if you're saying it's the capability to be able to do what we might want to do later on that you're looking to get to things like, you know, having those deep space exploration uh, vehicles suits, all of the systems that partnership with commercial, is that kind of the idea um, that, 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 that you mean there? Yeah. I just want to make sure that I understood that. Right. So yeah, we should be looking at like this, that, like I need this cat and that dog. It's really about what do we need to do science throughout the solar system with humans. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a key part of that is actually going to be human machine teaming as well. So we're going to, I mean, this is a cross agency strategy because we have to do tech development. We also have to understand a new way of doing science for our science mission directorate that actually puts humans in the loop in the decision-making process at the front line. 
So, Pam, um, we recently had an announcement from NASA that there would be what was termed as a delay to the remaining Artemis missions, especially Artemis three, the first landing. But from my viewpoint in the bleachers, being a journalist and not a NASA official, uh, this really just kind of puts us back on the original timetable that was accelerated by the Trump administration, if I'm if I'm reading my cues correctly. So when we originally heard about Artemis two and Artemis three, they were out about where they've returned to. So it feels like we've kind of returned to that. And this this is less of a delay and kind of more of a return to an achievable schedule, especially considering some of the major challenges that have to be overcome before you can do a human landing. It, not quite. I think NASA was looking at 28 to 30. Right. Uh, they were thinking that was achievable. I, I think we can beat that. I do think we can beat that. Um, but we also have to realistically acknowledge even those assumptions are based on perfect success of every mission. And while Artemis one was a success by any measure, there was a lot of learning that happened. And I think that's a more realistic set of expectations is that you're going to find things on the way, you know, these are test flights and no, no test flight ever goes perfectly. There's uh, you know, you, you hope for lessons learned that allow you to go fly as quickly as possible, but you, you have to tackle what you know um, but because, you know, you're developing a capability that we want to use for a decade or more. Right. So, you know, we, an operational capability. So you got to tackle that stuff right up front before you put another, uh, certainly put a crew on board. And that crew is, is training right now for Artemis, Artemis too. I mean, we, we saw, I think some, some water training earlier. I think we've got a, a look inside the, the capsule. What are you hoping to see, uh, in terms of improvements? Um, in either the, the vehicle or that training, you know, that, that the extra time is going to, uh, is it going to get you NASA and the, and, and the team overall? Well, we definitely have some analysis we're still working through. I think we're very close on, uh, closing on what the issues are around, uh, what we saw more charring than we expected that our models uh, showed us for the heat shield. But in addition to that, we've discovered some electronics issues that, are going to require to pull some electronics out and put it back in. And, you know, of course the crew module is going to be built from the inside out. So those become in the critical path going forward. And that's really what we needed the extra time for. I think the crew is actually grateful for this. I, I, I reflect on my own personal experience yeah. on one of the first ISS assembly missions. And I can tell you, I was on three assembly missions and the training for each one of them was very different and it was better every time. On the th third assembly flight, uh, ISS 3A, that was the one that I was on. Uh, some of the procedures that we had, we were making up as we went along because the ops had not yet, the you know, the maturity wasn't there until the hardware got on orbit. And really the integration was happening real time. And we had a lot of issues. I spent a lot of time looking at the software on station, looking at known bugs and other features and, and, and training around that. And so I think the crew is really helping to write the procedures as they go. So they can absolutely use that extra time. It's sort of the first time the crew meets the hardware really mm -hmm. face to face. And all of a sudden you find out all kinds of things <laughs> that will maybe not work perfectly the way they were planned. Well, and, and this brings up a really good point of, uh, and you talked about this earlier about this being kind of the experimental steps in a lot of ways we have to take for, for moving on to Mars and beyond. Um, so looking at, so we've got the SLS, we've got the Orion capsule, both have worked brilliantly so far. Then we've got these two lunar landers under development for now anyway, uh, maybe more later. And, and a lot of other technology, EVA suits and so forth. But I think one thing that is still kind of unclear to a lot of folks, at least in the general public, is sort of what the big picture is. You know, where, when does the, the, the base or the semi-permanent habitat on the surface get placed? When does Gateway come into play? And what's the big picture in terms of uh, long-term lunar exploration? Could you just address that in a nutshell? Yeah, I mean, it's possible to go online. We have an architecture concept uh, 
uh, and which we update every year as we learn new things, but also as we bring new international partners on who are developing elements and uh, putting those pieces in play. I would say we are right at the cusp of all the conversations that you're talking about. We're talking about pressurized and unpressurized rovers because mobility is a key aspect of being able to do science. Um, just one of my favorite statistics, it took 25 years for all the rovers on Mars to finally exceed the distance traveled during Apollo on the moon. Right. <laughs> and so those rovers really are important because they broaden the horizon of the science that you can get done. You can have a much greater diversity in terms of samples and, and just sort of understanding uh, someplace as a whole planet. So those things are really, really important. And those are definitely um, in, uh, I will say, full play right now. And we are having discussions about habitats. And I think uh, when we analyze the habitat situation, it's actually not clear whether we need like one place that you always go to. I think we think in the end, that's probably the right thing to do that because then you can con concentrate the infrastructure like the power grid and, the, and so forth. But even if you look at communications, if you're gonna be sending rovers out everywhere, do you need a pup tents? <laughs> and what about the comms situation? Do you want a 5G network on the moon? Is everything being bounced up to orbit? How is that working? So I would say a huge part of that is happening inside the agency right now and with our international partners. And, uh, you know, it, it sounds great to just, well, when are you going to build a moon base? Right. This is really about getting to the point of, well, what are the real requirements for this? And that's what we're in that in the middle of that requirements development hey if you enjoyed this clip be sure to check out this week in space you can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below see you there